Now, I'm very pleased to say that I'm now joined by Mark Meadows. And Mark, of course, was Chief of Staff in the White House to Donald Trump. Mark, welcome to GB News. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Nigel, great to be with you and a great interview with uh, my former boss, the guy I had the honor of serving as his chief of staff. Well, Mark, I have to say, you know, you know him very, very well. You've seen him uh, in, in his good moods and his less good moods. Uh, and I know the pressure is still on him. I know that following January the 6th, uh, people are being indicted. It's demanded they appear before committees. It's as if the Democrats believe or want to believe uh, that you guys attempted some kind of coup on the 6th of January. How heavy is all of that weighing on you and weighing on him? Well, obviously, it weighs on everybody. I, I, I can tell you that, uh, as you know, uh, there have been subpoenas issued for me and, and a, a number of other people. Uh, the, the president has made it very clear that he is uh, uh, claiming executive privilege, and not because he has anything to hide, but just because it would set a dangerous precedent if all of a sudden you have a, a president who speaks to his senior aides, myself included, uh, that that's subject to a, a partisan uh, inquiry uh, long after you're out of office. So it weighs heavy on everybody. I can tell you uh, uh, I, I'm going to be honoring his executive privilege. It's not something that I have the ability to waive. Uh, it's not something that is mine. It's uniquely uh, his, and uh, he's claimed that. And even uh, with uh, my... Uh, uh, interview that potentially is coming up with with the house uh, we'll be talking about non-privileged uh, information uh, anything that's executive privilege is going to continue to be honored mark thank you now for the last couple of weeks of that campaign last year um, I traveled around the country to many of these rallies and I saw you uh, I think every single one of them and it was amazing wasn't it I mean it was freezing cold uh, we were going through COVID uh, people in their tens of thousands would queue for hours in sub-zero temperatures uh, to go and see Trump speak and one of the points I tried to make to him there was that his base believe him and support him in a way that I've never seen for any political figure in my lifetime. And that, the inroads that he's made into the black and Latino vote, I mean, that is real. I mean, that actually has happened under Donald Trump. But I tried to make the point that comfortable, white, middle-class suburbia uh, has often found Donald Trump's New Yorker style a little bit too much. They find the drama of the whole thing a bit too much to cope with. And yet, when I put that to him, uh, he didn't seem to recognize that. But, but I think you know, every piece of decent polling, decent market research that we look at shows that there is a problem with that group of voters. If he is going to run again, what, in your view, does he need to do to reattract some of those people to the Republican Party and indeed his candidacy. Yeah, I, you know, that's that's something, Nigel, I get to hear on a, a pretty regular basis. But I will say this, there's nothing that makes somebody a believer more than 10 to 11 months of Joe Biden. Uh, you know, when you have Joe Biden in the White House and you start to look <laughs> at, at Joe Biden and what he's uh, he's done in in terms of building back better, he's built back better the Taliban, he's built back better China, He's built back better, uh, certainly uh, the drug cartel because of an open southern border. And so what we need to do is highlight those differences. And as you highlight those differences, I think what you'll find, Nigel, is uh, that a lot of people uh, may not like uh, his style. They may not be used to that New York kind of uh, uh, take no prisoners kind of style, but they certainly do like his results. And so we, we have to do a good job of showing how it's affecting them uh, on Main Street, whether that's in New York City or that's in Iowa or anywhere across the country. And, and I can tell you, high gas prices, uh, high grocery prices uh, and, and the like is a constant reminder each and every day that uh, the Donald Trump policies were actually good for the American people. 
Now, Mark, of course, you know, he's not going to declare that he is going to be a candidate because that sets off the election clock ticking and all sorts of different legal responsibilities. And I fully understand that. But I, I have to say, when he says to me that he's, he's there, he wants to be front and centre of the midterm campaign, but I pushed him, on why would he give up his incredible and, and I have to say, enviable lifestyle to go back to Washington, D.C.? And he said, well, if you love your country, it's what you have to do. You know him as well as anybody in recent times. He's running again, isn't he, Mark? Yeah, I don't speak for Donald Trump, but I can tell you that he's running again. Uh, he wouldn't be front and center, as your analysis showed in the 2022 election. And But it all boils down to one thing. He loves this country. He loves the people. He loves the, the, the very fact that uh, you should be able to be proud of your country. Uh, you should be able to salute your flag, uh, respect law enforcement, your first responders. That comes easy to him. You know, that's that's literally in his DNA. And so uh, for him to sacrifice much, which he did, obviously, during his first four years, he's going to be sacrificing a lot more. I fully anticipate that he throws his hat in the ring. And if he does, he will be the nominee.